Good morning. My name is Mike Olson. I'm an application engineer uh, in the HVAC group at uh, uh, ABB in Wisconsin. And this morning, the topic of my presentation is uh, how to get uh, free lead credits. Um, so leadership in environmental and energy, or energy and environmental design is what LEAD stands for. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'd like to, rather than talk at you, have this be interactive. So don't save your questions to the end. If questions come up, ask them at, as they come up, please. And I just passed. I've been doing this for three decades now. So I can uh, probably answer any VFD questions related to or not related to this product or this particular presentation. So if you have any questions on VFDs in general, feel free to ask those as well. So why we're all here probably is because VFDs are everywhere in buildings nowadays, whether it's commercial, industrial, uh, institutional, and that's for several reasons. First, of course, uh, uh, VFDs when used on centrifugal fans and pumps uh, conserve a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, I think pretty much most people know about the affinity laws or the fan laws where the horsepower drops is the cube of the speed on a centrifugal fan or pump. So at 50% speed, you only need 12.5% power. Um, the ASHRAE organization recognized that and uh, ASHRAE standard 90.1 actually requires uh, efficient part load control on fans or pumps above a threshold horsepower. And there's other ways to accomplish that. You can use uh, um, variable belts and shivs, pulleys, like your old 10-speed bicycle to vary the speed of the fan. There's maintenance and other issues with that. Um, uh, other types of variable speed technology like DC drives. Once again, there's some maintenance issues there with brushes and slip rings. So the easiest and uh, very efficient way of getting meeting the ASHRAE 90.1 is to put a VFD on the fans and pumps. So they're everywhere because of that. Also, recently, we uh, found sections in the LEED standards that say, well, if, since the VFDs are already there, you might also utilize these uh, efficiencies. And LEED requires, once again, as a prerequisite to get uh, to certify your building, it, you have to meet ASHRAE 90.1. So there's other things that variable frequency drives do. Uh, the intangibles are, are a little less easy to put a dollar figure on, but they're there. For example, the first one I have here is the fact that belts, shivs, motor bearings, things of that nature last longer when you're not starting them across the line. When you start a motor on a starter, it causes stress, the bearings pull over it's called when the belts and shivs are accelerating. Probably everybody in this room has heard the yelp from belts as you start something across the line, a belt slipping and squealing. And with a VFD you'll see when I start this little case here up here, it's a nice smooth acceleration ramp. There's none of that uh, wear and tear on the system. In addition, um, when you start a motor on a starter, it can pull 600, 800, or more percent inrush current. So it's for a very short period of time, but it's a, a massive slug of load on the building that the electrical system has to be able to support. So we often, in retrofit situations, find a uh, building where the automation system will start the supply fan first and then wait five minutes and start the return fan because they don't want all this inrush hitting at the same time on their building system. And the fact is you can start six VFDs at exactly the same time and still pull less current, substantially less current than one air handler across the line. So um, you can just program it to, if morning warm ups at five o'clock, have them all start at five o'clock in the morning. No need to stagger starts, things of that nature. So as I mentioned, in 2009, the lead, both the new construction and the major renovations uh, said this is a prerequisite that you have efficient part load control and therefore pretty much VFDs. Um, this is in the energy and atmosphere section. It's a prerequisite to says you must meet ASHRAE 90.1. So um, basically you can't even apply to get LEED certification on your building unless you have VFDs 
on fans or pumps. The last time I checked the ASHRAE 90.1 standard, it said any fan uh, over seven or at seven and a half horsepower above and any pump at 25 horsepower and above must have a VFD or must have efficient part load control, which equals VFDs basically. So in 2009, we looked at the energy and atmosphere section and found there's a measurement and verification uh, subsection in the uh, uh, energy and atmosphere section. And modern VFDs have for years, uh, I've been doing serial communication since 1994, and kilowatt hours was always one of the points I call them, BACnet calls them objects that are available to be served back to the building automation system. So as long as the VFDs are one of the points, or excuse me, the kilowatt hours is one of the points that's exposed to the energy management system, then you can easily pull that back on the front end. Um, in addition, we have instantaneous kilowatts and operating hours. So under credit five, measurement and verification, we can then take this front end back to the, or this information, back to the building automation system and help get some of these credits that are available in credit five. Um, once again, the kilowatt hours, kilowatts instantaneous, those kind of things are there. And the first cost savings, of course, is if you're trying to, you'll see in a couple of slides later, the credits or points, I call them, that are available for uh, lead certification is in the old days, if you wanted to get those, you had to buy $800 worth of operating hour meter and kilowatt hour meter, and then to pay for the cost to have that installed on the motor control center feeding the fan. Now, as soon as you buy the VFD, which is required by 90.1, the information's there, so you save the $800 in hardware cost. But more importantly, the labor cost. In the old days, once again, to take this data and do something with it, someone would have to, once a month, typically go to each of the motor control centers and document the kilowatt hours, document the operating hours, and press the reset buttons, and then load that data into a spreadsheet so that you could use for your verification and validation. Now that can be automatically done. You can just write the code in the building automation system to once a month go to Air Handler 6 VFD, download the kilowatt hours, send a reset to zero, download the operating hours, send a reset to zero, and build your report with no human intervention whatsoever. So while the $800 worth of meters is nothing to sneeze at, it's really not the big cost savings, is the labor for gathering all these statistics and doing something with them. Also in the lead existing buildings, they have a similar subsection. So whether it's a new construction or a renovation of an existing building, these credits are available. So basically under credit 3.1, you get one point for having a building automation system. If you don't have a building automation system, once again, you're probably wasting your time applying to lead because it's gonna be very difficult to get lead. It's a, almost a prerequisite. And then credit 3.2, you get one credit or I call them points for a 40% um, energy value. So if you're monitoring up to 40% uh, or at least 40% of the energy usage and documenting it, you get an additional credit. Well, since we just said VFDs are omnipresent in the building, VFDs are one of the largest loads in the building, it pretty much is guaranteed you're gonna be at this 40% level. If you bring the data back and document it and generate a, a m and report, you're gonna get the 40%. If you have a lot of VFDs, or you have VFDs on your chillers, you can hit the 80% level and get two credits with no additional money. The VFDs are there, just land the back net wire and set up the front end to pull the data. Okay? So that's where the headline of this uh, talk was free lead credits, because the VFDs gotta be there. You might as well use the data. So once again, you bring that data back to the front end and then automatically create the m and report. So since we came up with this idea in 2009, we've helped many, many uh, facilities get uh, lead credits from this monitoring and verifications part of it. As I said, the main savings is probably the labor, or undoubtedly the labor, 
there's some in the, in the hardware itself. And finally, um, recently, drive manufacturers have been doing the math in our product rather than the front end. And actually, when the smart guys in R&D first came up with this stuff, I'm like, this is a waste of time because we've been transmitting kilowatt hours back to the uh, building automation systems for 20 years. And it, the math is very easy, right? You set a baseline for how much uh, power an air handler unit takes, and then anytime you're running at less than full power, so today, for example, I'm sure in Vegas the design temperature for the air handler system is probably like 130 degrees. It's only going to be 99 today. So the system doesn't need to operate at full, full load. So for years, we've been having this kilowatt data available to the front end. It's not rocket science to take the baseline, subtract the actual kilowatts, and then multiply it times your local cost per kilowatt hour charge and come up with how much you saved. Well, so our R&D guys said, well, we can build that right in the drive. We can do the math in the drive. And if you have a bypass, it can be done automatically. It's called a learn mode. You just put the bypass in the learn mode. It runs the application at full speed for however long you program it. Out of the box, it comes for six hours, but you can do it for two, three days. And obviously, the longer you run to set your baseline, the more accurate it's going to be. You have night and day and, and various temperatures. And then once it learns it, you just say, my local cost of electricity is 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and then it'll automatically do the math. If you don't have a bypass, it's a manual situation. You run the VFD up to the full speed, look at the kilowatt usage, and, and document that. And then anytime it's running at part load, it will do the calculations. So once again, I was thinking to myself, this is pretty much a waste because of the fact that it's not rocket science. It's very easy math to do. And darn if there's another case where I wasn't wrong again. Um, when you see this on the keypad, what we found is it is a very powerful tool. So a facility manager will be walking down past with his boss and say, oh, look at this. This drive saved $12,000 so far. And his boss says, hey, good job for recommending we put these drives on these fans and pumps in the building. And then the director of facilities ends up calling the consulting engineer and said, hey, thanks for specking these drives. They've saved us a tremendous amount of energy. So while I didn't think it was important at all to have these kind of statistics on our system, since it's available elsewhere, it's turned out to be a very popular uh, feature. And a lot of people are using it. I guess we all like to be told we've made a good decision and a purchasing decision. You know, it's just human nature. So um, in addition to that, some variable frequency drives have the capability of calculating the tons of CO2 that you didn't put into the atmosphere because you didn't use the electricity and therefore you avoided putting the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, yes, sir? With that keypad up there, mm -hmm. we have thousands, but on the old ones, I don't. Is it just in the keypad that's programmed in? Can I just like say I wanted one to say that? No, it's in the drive firmware. So it was a feature that uh, the R&D boys, we re-released it in 2008. So if the drive's older than 2008, the only way to get it would be to flash new firmware in it. If it's uh, after 2008, it's in there. You just got to go in and turn it on. And your, your local rep can show you how to do it. It's, it's, it's trivial. It's very easy. Um, and the CO2, one of the concerns I had is this was based on Wisconsin, where I live where we have 80% fossil fuel is what creates our electricity. We don't have a lot of nuclear, we don't have any hydro, uh, some wind, but anyhow. So what about Washington State, where they have a, a lot of hydroelectric power? Oh yeah, that's a factor, you just go in and adjust it to make the tons of CO2 calculations more accurate. No, it's, it's based on how many kilowatt hours you saved. What we found that, once again, with 80% fossil fuel, so either coal or natural gas. Correct. Yes, indoor air quality. Yeah, how much, because you didn't, once again, burn the electricity to create the carbon in the first place. 
Yeah. Now, these are great questions because the next thing I want to lead into is kind of a real world example. That's why I brought this thing to show you some of that. And that's one of the control strategies for a VFD that you can use. Actually, my last talk today is talking about we have, as soon as I land this wire here on the VFD, over back then, I have 73 points of information. Amps, volts, kilowatts, faults, uh, set points. Uh, so you can do your CO2 uh, indoor air quality adjustment, adjust the set point and move the set point up when the CO2 gets high, things of that nature. So uh, I wanted to pull that up and show you some real world applications there. And in my talk at three, three o'clock this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about out of those 73 points, what are the important ones to pull back to the front end? Because obviously if you get 30, 40 VFDs in a building and you're pulling 73 points back from each one, you can load down the network needlessly. You don't need all 73 points. So any other questions on this? Okay, now it's gonna get fun, especially for the recording. The resolution on this uh, program I've got only allows me to have it up there. So you're gonna see me walking around and driving over my shoulder but it's the best way to uh, show this particular application. Uh, it's down here. So right now, it looks like I'm talking to the VFD. I'll get it a little more centered screen here. So on this graphic, what I have here, this EMS box represents the energy management system. So for uh, Siemens, it would be a field panel for some of the other manufacturers call it different things, but it's the energy management system. You see it talking over serial communications. I got one twisted pair of wire here going between the drive and the uh, energy management system, which in this case is simulated by my computer here. This box represents this little gray drive here. So in this case, I've got next to me, what I have is a, a seven and a half horsepower VFD this gray box I got my hand on, and all the rest of it, it's for demonstration purposes. There's a little 115 to 40 volt transformer down here behind the switch. There's a three phase 460 volt motor here. Um, now it's, it's a one tenth kilowatt motor, and this is a seven and a half horsepower drive, so I can't see kilowatts because it's not any load on this thing. It's a little bitty motor, so the case is not super heavy. Uh, but I'll be able to show you amps, and output speed from the VFD, things of that nature. Um, the green lights you see on the case here are some of the safeties that are wired in. So if my Freestat opens, let's see if I can do this without looking, you'll see the uh, Freestat turn color and the light went off, it also went off on the case. Okay. So it's the IO coming from the building automation system to the drive and some of the IO that we're commanding back to other hardware in the building. What I have simulating here is a static pressure sensor that's wired directly back to analog input one on the VFD. And that's just basically VAV box position. So I've got these simulate these three zones going out to the building. As the thermostat in the room gets satisfied, the VAV box closes down, pressure goes up. The drive compares the feedback to the set point and either speeds up or slows down to control the pressure. Now we recommend doing this in this method so that you keep the network traffic low. If I'm trying to keep a nice constant pressure in this room and I'm doing the math here, I'm doing the PID loop in the energy management system, I might have to send a new reference once a second and there's 30, 40, 50 drives in the building, it can tie up the automation system needlessly by sending too many commands. This way what I'm doing is I'm sending it an inch and a half of static pressure for occupied and unoccupied night setback, I'm sending it 30 hertz. I'll just let it run 30 hertz all night long. And so I got two commands a day, occupied and, and night setback. So it keeps the network traffic low, keeps the bandwidth available for other important stuff that's going on with the building automation system. So uh, the other things I have shown on this graphic, once again, these are the VAV boxes. So as I grab this top pot on the demo case, I'm simulating VAV boxes closing down, pressure goes up. VAV boxes open up, pressure goes down, okay? Here's my set point. I've also got isolation dampers here. So I've got these dampers that I wanna make sure they're open before this VFD runs. 
or else I'll overpressurize the ductwork and hopefully have an overpressure switch there because there's nothing worse than taking square duct and making it round duct. It makes for an unhappy owner. Okay? So that's wired directly to the VFD. So whenever the VFD gets a run command or I'm ready to go command, whether it's from somebody coming up and pushing a hand button or the building automation system or contact closure, there's a lot of different ways to start these modern technologies. It's going to first fire relays. Those relay outputs then open the dampers and tell the dampers I'm getting ready to go here. When they get all the way open, the end switch proof comes back to the VFD and says the dampers are open, now you can run. So it's called a run permissive circuit. Um, I've also got a fireman's override signal coming in, and we'll talk in a minute about these chill water loops. So when I give this thing a run command, first thing you'll hear and see these relays fire to tell the dampers, I'm ready to go, let's open up. So the dampers are opening. Now when they get all the way open, the end switch comes back to the VFD, that's just the contact closure. And since my set point is less than my, or my set point is greater than my feedback, it's gonna speed up. So digital input two. Okay, so now the drive is ramping this fan up to trying to control the pressure in that supply fan ductwork, okay? As the pressure increases, the drive will slow the fan down. And you see that here, the output speed is going up and down. As the pressure uh, decreases, it'll speed up. So it's all automatic, unmanned, you just go in and give it a set point and it, it operates itself, okay? So one of the things that us drive guys realized was critical was making sure the sequence of operation proves out properly. For example, in the old days, we had drives with a handoff auto selector switch on the front cover of the VFD. So it was very easy for the whoever was controlling the building to go in and basically cut the wire on the hand position and keep the customer from blowing his ductwork up. Now it's all in software. The handoff autumn is a membrane keypad. It's a button. There's no wire to cut. Okay? Also, I live in Wisconsin. In the winter, it's 20 below zero outside. If my freeze stat is this coil's about to freeze up already. The last thing I want to do at six o'clock in the morning, unmanned, there's nobody in the building yet, is open this outside air damper up and let more cold air come in on a coil that's already about to explode. So if I take the freeze stat away here, you see the digital input go away, and now I can hit start all day long and it's not gonna run because the brains in the VFD are saying, uh oh, I've got a safety issue here. And on the keypad, some of you might be able to see, it's telling me that I've got a safety open. So you don't let cold air in on a coil that's about to freeze up. If the safety's made, then when I give it the run command, it will open the dampers and prove out. Another thing that we felt was important to build into the VFD is, of course, the feedback. The static pressure sensor is now directly wired on the VFD instead of into the building automation system. They might need that for other things. If you're doing chill water reset or something of that nature, you need to know this, what the static pressure is, what the feedback is. So we also, that's one of those 73 points of information that gets fed back to the building management system. They can poll however often they need to poll it, okay? Another thing is we just felt that it was critical to have this system, since we're building the automation now into the VFD, respond properly to all cases. So when the damper in switch closes, I take off. Got to get the pressure below the set point. Okay, so now I speed up. Let's say the wire gets cut. So I've lost communications with the building automation system. The VFD is a standalone right now. So what we did, and uh, Chris Hollinger actually gave me this, is to me, DDC is not direct digital control, it's distributive digital control. You put the brains for the application out as close to the application as you can. So right now, even though I'm not connected to the VFD, I'm still using the brains here to control static pressure. Still, if pressure goes up, I'm going to slow down. 
the pressure goes up, I'm going to speed up. Now, of course, the graphics not changed because I'm not connected to the computer. But it's still standalone operation, doing the same thing that <coughs> um, the KMC controller would do, keeps the last good command that came from the mothership and keeps on cooking. Okay? So when I get communications back, now I can go to night setback and just run at 30 hertz all day long. I'm not controlling static pressure anymore. Those boxes can open and close and I'm not going to just stir an air in the building, keeping hot spots from building up at night, uh, keeping from losing control of the building, losing humidity control, things of that nature, but I'm not, I don't care about controlling static pressure. I'm just stirring air. Okay. So very powerful. Um, and we've had this since uh, uh, the mid 90s, this kind of control capability. Then in, uh, let me turn this off so I'll make the no I got that bearing going out in the motor here from being drug all over the world. And uh, I leave it that way because then you can hear when it's running. <laughs> so I like it that way. What? Yes, sir. That's one solution. So um, that's not what's going on here. This is just this demo case has been dropped so many times. There's a flat spot on the bearing <laughs> from that. From that, but yes. So yes, that's called um, bearing currents, and it's caused by stray. Uh, let's see how much time now. It's called by stray uh, voltage, it's called common mode uh, noise. So all VFDs use in our output switches. These things called IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistor. It's a very fast switch. It goes from off to full on in microseconds, 200 microseconds. Okay, that for the first time ever, and in the early 90s, when uh, IGBT technology first started being utilized by all of us, can set up this common mode noise. So, what it is is if you take the wire that's in the slots of the AC motor. In the old days, we used to hand wind those. Well, now you can't afford to do that with a motor, especially on the little ones. So those are all machine wound. So there's a machine that winds this little electric wire. And if you get wire that stacks up nice and easy in the automated winding process, it'll be a one length, and then you can get the winding machine that stacks a bunch of wire up this way and then the next one jumps down here and builds up and the next one jumps down. The end result is you can have wire in slots of the motor that in this slot is just a little bit longer than the wire in the next slot. Okay? Now we hit it with that square waveform, that pulse that calls from a pulse width modulation drive. And in a perfect world, if those wires were all exactly the same length, the stray voltage would cancel because it's all 120 electrical degrees apart, it ends up being zero. But it's not a perfect world. These um, motors are wound in very low cost countries, it's make as many of them as you can, as cheaply as you can. So they're not gonna be exactly the same. And that little bit of difference causes this common mode noise that wants to and will find its way back to the VFD, to the source. So this electrical noise is going to find its way back to the source. Our challenge on a good VFD installation is to make sure that the path of least resistance, the lowest impedance path, isn't through the bearings. Okay? So this common mode noise builds up on the rotor, or excuse me, on the state, yeah, on the rotor. And if it gets to a certain level, like about 50 volts, It'll jump through the bearing, through the grease. So normally grease in a motor bearing is an insulator. It doesn't let electricity flow. But sooner or later it breaks down and will allow a spark to, to go through. So it basically comes down to installation. What a good VFD installation looks like is having a metal conduit between the motor and the VFD. That metal conduit should be bonded, you know, good electrical. That's why on our conduit box on the bottom there, it's non-painted metal. It's not because we're cheap and we don't want to paint the metal, it's because we want a good electrical connection. If there's paint on your motor, you want to scrape it off so that that metal to metal bonding is there. 
you want four wires instead of three. You got your three conductors, the three phases between the motor and the drive, but you also want a fourth ground conductor so that if this uh, common mode noise occurs, it will go through that wire rather than through the bearings to get back to the VFD. So what bearing currents are typically caused by is um, less than ideal installations and you don't have that fourth wire run. So now it's going to jump through the bearings to the motor grounded right there, go back through the building grounding system and then to the ground that's attached to the VFD. So besides taking out your bearings, it can prematurely, it can also cause electrical gremlins to run around in your building because this, this voltage. That's correct. And there it goes through the brushes instead of build. It basically never builds up. So it looks like a sawtooth. The vol if you were to put a scope on there, now we make special scopes with special probes that you can rest on the rotating shaft. And you'd see build up to 50, jump to zero build up to 50, jump to zero. So that's when that spark, it's called electromotive machining. Every time the spark jumps through the bearing, it takes a little piece of metal with it. That spark bites off a little piece of the bearing. And soon you'll get frosting, it's called, and, and uh, bearing fluting happen, okay? So what the brush does, which once again is one solution, you shouldn't need it if it's installed properly and it's a single motor, single drive. You have the ground wire and the metal conduit. Um, common mode noise likes surface area. It likes to congregate on the big conduit. That's why we use the metal conduit. It's a lot more surface area for it to run back to the VFD. Uh, but one place where it's very difficult to do that is the fan array technology. So you've got one VFD and 12 motors. They take, you know, little flexible there's no conduit there. They take flexible wires through motor overloads and go to the individual 12 motors. So now you got, you know, instead of uh, four wires you got to pull, you'd have to pull 48 or whatever, and they just won't do it. They, as standard, most of the OEMs that build the fan array systems now put the brushes on those motors out because they know they can't pull the ground. It's not going to be an ideal installation. Okay. Yeah, you, sh you shouldn't have failure after the grounding br brushes. Like anything else, though, that technology is fairly new. And, and ABB, you know, we, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on drive research and development. And we're also the world's largest manufacturer of motors besides manufacturers of drives. So we tried all sorts of things like uh, conductive grease. Instead of letting it build up till it jumps, do the same as the brushes never let it build up in the first place by letting it conduct through the grease. Well, we found that had its own issues that it changed as temperature changed the electrical character. It was a major problem. Uh, tried making special motors with uh, Faraday shielding built into the motor to keep the current bearing currents from building up. There's all sorts of different things. The brushes turned out to be the cheapest, easiest smacking on there. But just like everything else, it's not without maintenance. If you get dust or oil built up on that shaft, now the conductive path between the brushes and the shaft is not as good as it was before built, built up. So what we're finding is that just like everything else, you have to maintain. Once you put the brushes on there, I don't know, it depends on how much oil's in the air, in the local installation, things of that nature, but you're gonna have to probably loosen the one half of the brush, fold it back, and get in there with an emery cloth and clean off the shaft so you get a good conduct and then, then you shouldn't have it. But yes? Wow. I, uh, that's, that's a new one to me. I hadn't heard that. There might be something else going on. So is it an ABB drive? It is? Okay. Why don't you come see us in booth 412 and uh, we'll get somebody out there because that's very unusual. But once again, it's one of those things that it's not an art, but it's not a science either. I'm, I've been doing this 30 years. Um, two or three times, I've not been able to figure. The installation looked good and we were still having an issue. You know? But 
we need to keep this in perspective. Just out of our little plant in Wisconsin, we ship 150,000 drives a year, and we have barren current issues a handful of times, right? Um, I have one in a, uh, uh, probably can't say the name of the place, it, they make synthetic blood in uh, Colorado. And there's 10 exhaust fans up on the roof outside, and the VFDs are quite far away in the, in the building. And they ran the cable up inside metal conduit, so I couldn't see, the walls were already up by the time I got called, so I couldn't see inside of the walls, but it looked all right. At the VFD, the connection looked good, it was bonded good, got up to the roof, it looked like the conduit was single run all the way up there, they pulled the fourth grounding wire, and it was only one motor out of 10 kept eating the bearing cell. So finally, I got on my hands and knees and crawled around and I looked under and on the conduit box of this one motor, it turned out that motor had had a failure. Sometimes warranty failures occur. And the contractor who replaced the motor was different than the installing contractor who had installed them in the first place. And he thought he was doing a good thing. He put a rubber grommet underneath there to keep water, to keep moisture out of the motor uh, conduit box. Well, what he had done is broken the electrical path back to the VFT. So he thought he was doing a good thing and he ended up causing the issue. They get rid of this, and they never had any, any bearing clearance after that. But as I said, there have been a handful of times when I've crawled all over, and I still don't know why, why they're happening. They just happen. But we got some real smart guys. Uh, who, we'll, we'll figure out what's going on. It's good chances. All right, so these are all real good questions. Let's see if I have uh, got a couple seconds left. I'll uh, show you some of the other capabilities. Unless, more questions? Okay. So in early 2000s, we said, we've got all these relay outputs built into our product. Now, we typically in the HVAC industry don't need a lot of relays, but this same product hardware called the ACS 550 is used in the industrial world. In the industrial world, you need analog outputs and relay outputs. For example, if I've got two conveyors running and this VFD is running, I better make sure this one's running or I'm gonna have boxes falling all over the place. So you take a run contact from this one to start this one. I also need an analog output because I want the conveyors running at the same speed, up and down. I don't want this one running a lot faster than this one, or once again, I'm gonna get boxes falling all over the place. So for quantities of scale, we use the exact same boards and the same power structure in the industrial drive as we do the HVC drive. So we've got these relays, they're free. So what we turned over to the energy management system is the capability now exposed these relays once again. So I can fire a relay, it has nothing to do with the drive, the drive's not even running right now. But when I click here, hopefully you saw a light come on in the demo case, relay output four just clicked on. I can do the same with any of the other relays. This one, relay output three is being used to drive these VAV boxes full open. If I go to bypass mode, now I'm running 60 hertz. I'm developing full pressure out of that fan. If the VAV boxes are way closed down, once again, you can override, uh, overpressurize the duct. Oh, going the wrong way. So what I can do is from the bypass, anytime somebody goes up and selects bypass, I can fire relays to go and drive those VAV boxes all the way open so the pressure has somewhere to go because I'm not in control mode anymore, I'm in full speed mode, okay? So that's one thing we did. We turned over all of our relay outputs to the building automation system. As you can see, we've turned over all the digital inputs. You can see what's going on. You can see whether the safety's made or not made. In addition then, in 2004, we said, let's turn over our analog outputs. So the simulation on this hot water valve here is that the hot water sensor is feedback directly to the energy management system, to the building automation system. They're doing the PID loop and then they're commanding our analog output, okay? So once again, it has nothing to do with the VFD, but I can go to the analog output here and I need 20 milliamps of, of hot water. So now some of you can see the meter on this, this drive is up full. I don't need that, I only need uh, 12 milliamps so I can go 50%. So once again, nothing to do with the VFD. It's a free analog output that's available. Now the issue with this, of course, is if the math is being done here and I lose communications, 
that valve's going to stay at that last command at 50%. I don't have control over it. So we said that's not ideal. Let's put an extra PID loop in our product. So we've got the one PID loop that's controlling the static pressure of the system. And I got another one that I'm using for this chill water valve. So here I give it a set point, and then that'll be this bottom pot. So in this simulation, the temperature sensor from the chill water loop is coming back to the VFD, to my unused analog input. So as temperature goes down, I close down my chill water valve. As temperature goes up, I, I start modulating the chill water valve. So let me start the VFD. So once again, and which, which analog output is that? Is it the top one or the bottom one? It's the bottom one. Okay. So once again now, I've started the VFD. My damper in switch is closed, the dampers are open. So I've got control. If I lose communications with the front end, not only am I still controlling drive speed, but also that chill water valve is still being controlled. Now the graphic's not changing, but if anybody can see this meter here, I've still got positive control on the chill water loop because the brains are here rather than elsewhere. So once again, that distributive digital control. And if I get this back, then you see the chill water adjusting again. So that's where we are today. Where we're going in the very near future is with BACnet has alarming and trending capabilities. We're adding that into our next generation product to where we can tell people that they've got an issue and they can you know, print out a uh, maintenance request and get somebody to go look at it before it breaks. So a good example is a slipping belt. So broken belt we have today. VFD manufacturers, we're monitoring output power at all times. If the power drops down, we send it information back to the building management system. As a matter of fact, and all these guys control it, it's a dedicated point, point that we call under load. It goes, zero goes to one on the automation system, said belts broke, go fix it. That just saved another $100 uh, Hawkeye current transducer. You don't need it anymore because it's the automation's built in the VFD. But where we're going is to put abnormal conditions programming into the VFD so we can set an alarm back through the BACnet system. For example, if a belt starts slipping versus breaking, amps go up and down, right? The belt starts slipping, amp goes way down, it catches and grabs again and amps shoot way up. So instead of being a nice constant flow, amps only changing one or two amps as the air handlers unit, they're pinging like this, up and down, up and down. Well, they have the building automation guys detect that, they could, because they see current back at the front end, but once again, bandwidth. To do that, you'd use up a, a ton of bandwidth on the automation system, so we're gonna do it in our end. We set what's normal, and if it's outside of normal conditions, send an alarm back, say, okay, go fix this, tension this belt before it breaks, before it becomes catastrophic, oh, my air handler went down, send somebody out to fix it. Um, drive temperature. We can do that today. That one's just a one threshold. It's not very dynamic. If the drive temperature increases to a certain amount, send an output, say, time to go clean the filters in the VFD. The filters are dirty. They're loaded up. It's starting to build up temperature. Um, some other things, but I, I can't tell you about those because they're definitely going to turn the industry again. We're working on some uh, other very proactive ways to use this energy management information to positively control the building and do things that uh, keep it from being a catastrophic uh, problem. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Got about five minutes here. I've got another screen that uh, I can put up here showing you cooling tower control and things of that nature, but um, that was the basis of what I wanted to tell you, and I respect your time. So uh, please stop past and see us at, at booth 412 we can show you more information or, or uh, and i need to get your your information where you're at any other questions okay well thank you very much for coming